welcome. If this is your first time, what I'm going to do is just give a quick overview of who St. Peter was, uh, why he wrote uh, the first of his two letters that we find in the New Testament. Come on in, guys. We're starting in here tonight. Um, why he wrote the first of his two letters, and then we'll break out into the groups. If you know what group you're going to, fantastic. If you don't know what group you're going to, we will help you get to that group. Um, if you were here in the fall, it's basically everybody's going to the same group, unless, you know, you really don't want to. Uh, and then you can come and talk to me, and we want everybody to be comfortable and happy and all those good things. All right. We are doing... Uh, <coughs> working with N.T. Wright again. So we started with this type of uh, study in the fall. You'll get one of these books tonight that will be handed to you. It has First and Second Peter and Jude. We are not doing Second Peter in this session. The reason we're not doing Second Peter is not that we don't like Second Peter. Second Peter is awfully good. It's a it's a wonderful letter. Uh, we're doing it so we can finish before Lent because during Lent we're going to have Stations of the Cross and and all of that. We won't have this uh, Bible study format during Lent this year. Last year we went all the way through Lent, uh, and we know a lot of people miss the opportunity to go to Stations of the Cross. So we're trying to uh, have a seven week study. Uh, on 1 Peter is uh, the next uh, five weeks after tonight, and then the last week will be on the Epistle of Jude, uh, which is just one chapter on a short book in the New Testament. All right? The goal of all of this is to grow closer to God, to grow spiritually, to have a greater sense of, of God's work uh, in the world and God's presence in our lives, and we're going to do that by studying his word, uh, which is written in Holy Scripture. So part of what we think we're doing when we open up the Bible is we think that we're hearing the voice of God. We believe God speaks to us on the pages of Holy Scripture. And so if we want to grow closer to him, one of the best things we can do is crack that bad boy open and get to studying. As I said, we're using N.T. Wright's book. N.T. Wright is a, a retired bishop from the Church of England. He's one of the foremost uh, New Testament scholars in the world. Uh, I hope you'll like this format that we're using here uh, again this time. Take the book. It's got places in there to answer questions. He asks questions. He wants you to read through it. Uh, and he wants us to make sure uh, that we meet our goal of growing closer to God by answering the questions and doing all this in the context of prayer. So if we're going to be hearing the voice of God, uh, we need to open our hearts up to his guidance. And so all of this should not be done, you know, at, uh, on the fly, like as you're, you know, eating dinner and quickly answering like questions. Hopefully there's enough time in your schedule to set aside a few minutes before you come to Bible study uh, so that you can pray, so that you can read through the passage and so that you can answer the questions uh, that will make the group discussions a lot more meaningful if everybody's thought through the answers to the questions. Uh, a big part of the value of the group is, is sharing your perspective um, and uh, also hearing the perspectives of, of others. And, and it really relies on everybody uh, doing, uh, doing some of that work. I said this last time, but what we're looking for in this study is observation. So like what is actually written in the Bible. We're going to observe what St. Peter wrote, and then interpretation, like what does it mean, and then application, like what difference does it make in my life, right? So we're not just uh, studying this intellectually. We're studying this for a very specific purpose. This, by the way, is a big part of the reason uh, that we do theology in the Anglican tradition. It's not just uh, more knowledge about God. But it's with a goal in mind, and it's one of the unique sort of distinctives about Anglican theology, uh, that we do it with a specific purpose. It's not just to gather more knowledge. It's to grow closer to God. 
That's why theology is done. That's why Bible reading is done. And as I say, it relies really on all three phases of the game. When I introduced this last time, I had Coach Garrett up there, but I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I always talked about all three phases of the game. So this relies on uh, personal study. It really does rely on you kind of doing some work outside of this. If you can at all make time for the Bible or this Bible study, you're going to get a lot out of it if you put in the personal time to do that. Uh, come to the small group. Hear what your brothers or your sisters in Christ have to say going to help with the interpretation. It's going to help with the application for sure. And then you'll come in here and uh, listen to uh, either Father Cooper and I probably confuse everything that was really clear coming into the discussion. First Peter is written, <coughs> spoiler alert, by Peter. All right. Now, if you open up your average study Bible or your average commentary, you might read something different. Uh, but there's a lot of good evidence that this is written by, by uh, none other than uh, Simon Peter, who we know is a Galilean uh, fisherman. We know that from the Gospels. Uh, he's one of the first apostles. He's uh, obviously along with his brother Andrew. And he becomes this really important figure in the life of the early church when, when he uh, is the first to proclaim Jesus as uh, the Messiah, what we call the confession of St. Peter. Uh, and this, this uh, vignette is recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels uh, are similar to each other. They follow similar tracks, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and Jesus says, I mean, and Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ the son of the living God. He says that at Caesarea Philippi, and if you're going on the Holy Land trip this summer, you'll get to go to Caesarea Philippi, and we'll read these Bible verses, and it'll be really cool, because you'll get a great sense of what was happening. But Jesus says this, uh, Peter says this uh, to Jesus, and Jesus back to him says something really important that makes Peter this really, really critical figure in the life uh, of the early church. Okay, so, so Peter's really the first one to get it. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is a transitional moment. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, it's the exact center verse in the Gospel. If you look at all of the verses, right in Mark 8 here, uh, it's the very center verse because it's the center of the, of the center of the center. Right? Like if you're if the Bible's the core of our faith and the gospel is the core of the Bible, well, this confession is the core of the gospel. You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. When Peter says this, he's the first to say it, and he says it really for all Christians who ever come to faith in Jesus. This is our proclamation that we make. You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus says something back to him that makes him this really important figure. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon. So his name is Simon at this point, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Right? So... Peter becomes this really, really important figure here as Jesus gives him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and that's where every joke about heaven begins, right? They're at the pearly gates with St. Peter, and he's got the keys and the list, and it's all hilarious from there. <laughs> Simon becomes Kepha in Aramaic. That's what the name that Jesus gives him, and that means rock. All right, so you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, is how it gets translated uh, in uh, our Bibles. That name rock in the Greek becomes uh, Petros, and so that's where we get the name Peter from. The name Peter means rock. When I was first ordained, I served as the curate down at St. Vincent's, and uh, there's an older priest down there. He's still around, Father Cantrell. And he had really two sermons that he would preach every time he preached. First one was his, and, and I'm not, I hesitate to even say it, but I know the reaction that's going to happen. First one was his eat me sermon. 
all right? So he was, he was talking about the Eucharist, and, and I, won't go, I won't give the sermon, but he was very, uh, he gave it frequently. And the second one was his Rocky sermon, okay? And he always wanted to talk about St. Peter was Rocky in the Bible. So the name Peter means rock. And what Jesus is saying to him is, uh, first of all, that he will be the rock of the church, and second of all, that his profession that he makes is going to be the, the rock, uh, the bedrock of what the church is going to build on. So really, really important moment, really, really important to understand that Peter takes this, this place of critical importance at this moment, uh, and, and we see uh, as Jesus uh, ascends into heaven that Peter takes, takes this almost Christ-like role in uh, the early days of the church. So every time that the apostles are mentioned in the New Testament, Peter's name always appears first. Uh, Judas's name always appears last in every one of those lists, by the way. Uh, and Peter becomes this really, really important figure as the Holy Spirit falls on the early church on the day of Pentecost. Peter goes out. They go out of that upper room, no longer afraid. And the first person to speak is Peter. He, he takes this, this uh, commission that Jesus gives him seriously, uh, and he preaches the first really Christian sermon uh, there. And we read that people are baptized and converted. Uh, Peter, we read about him doing things that only Jesus does uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. So he, he raises uh, this young girl named Dorcas uh, from the dead. Great name, by the way, Dorcas. If you're thinking about, we, we were hoping Violet was going to be Dorcas, but it didn't work out. Um, there's still a chance next time, Jessica. There's some more kids. Um, and then there's this, this part about how people People are getting healed, and they're lining up in the street just to hope that Peter's shadow will touch them in Acts chapter 5, in the hopes that even his shadow falling on them will bring healing to them. So we are reading about this, this really, really monumental figure. The Acts of the Apostles is a book. The first half is about St. Peter's ministry, and the second half is about uh, St. Paul's ministry. And so Peter and Paul are the two great leaders of the early church. And Peter is going to exercise uh, his leadership uh, first in Jerusalem, and then uh, he goes to Antioch, and then he later goes to Rome. All right, Rome being sort of the very center of the world at this time. Tradition tells us that Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. He dies during the persecution of the emperor Nero sometime between 64 and 67 AD. And he writes this letter, 1 Peter, that we're going to study just before he dies. We know he writes it from Rome because in at the end of the letter is where we get some clues about the letter itself. But in one of the very last verses, it says that he's writing it from Babylon, <clears throat> not actually in Babylon. Uh, Babylon refers to Rome. And this is what they call ancient Rome in the early church. Uh, and we know that because throughout the book of Revelation, uh, St. John sees these visions of the whore of Babylon and, and Babylon the Great and all this, and he's referring to Rome. So St. Peter's in Rome. He's about to die. The persecutions have begun. And so he writes this letter. The... Persecution begins right after the fire, what's called the Great Fire of Rome, that happens in July of 64 AD. Uh, the Emperor Nero, he takes over as the emperor. I think he's like 12 or 13 years old. He's, he's a young guy. Uh, and he, uh, he, there's a real power struggle. And so historians believe that Nero actually sets a fire in Rome right near what's called the Circus Maximus. That's where they do all the games, you know, and uh, races, chariot races and all that. He sets a fire right there and it burns for a couple weeks and like two thirds of the city of Rome is burned down. Well, this works out real well for him because he enslaves a bunch of people and taxes people and he gets to build it all brand new 
And by the way, the senators who he had to share power with, well, their quarters also got burned down just accidentally. Uh, so it works out pretty well for him because he consolidates power as well. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, what happens is the smear campaign begins and he blames it on the early Christians. So the intensity of the moment starts ratcheting up. The Christians become very unpopular very quickly. There's lots of rumors going around about the Christians that they're cannibals because, of course, they speak of eating the body and blood of Christ. And so there's a, a whole misinformation campaign that gets spread about Christianity. Uh, and the, the persecutions begin, and then Christians start getting killed in all kinds of nasty ways. And as I said a minute ago, St. Peter himself ends up getting killed, we think, by getting crucified upside down. Why upside down? Well, tr the tradition says that uh, they were going to crucify him the same way they crucified Jesus, but that uh, he asked, he said, I'm not worthy to die the same way my Lord did and asked to be crucified upside down. So as the heat's getting turned up, uh, St. Peter, he uh, writes this letter, and he writes this letter at, as a way to encourage the early Christians as they face tough times. And he does this, there's sort of four main themes that, uh, that he wants the early Christians to be thinking about and praying about as they're facing immense challenges and as things are getting more and more tense for them. First of all, he talks about the primacy and the importance of the Old Testament. Uh, he wants to build Christian theology on what's happened before Christ. Now that seems so basic and obvious to us, but it's absolutely critical uh, that there aren't two stories. Remember, we, did, we talked about this when we talked about Ephesians, if you were here. There isn't a plan A in the Old Testament and then a plan B in the New Testament. There's always plan A, all right? These, this is a consistent arc from a consistent God who makes promises and keeps them. All right, so he, he, you're going to read about all kinds of Old Testament figures in the, in the coming week. Uh, and and it, he's going to build a theology on that. He wants to focus on the reality of suffering. And he attempts in this letter to understand the purpose of suffering, something that the Christians have long struggled to understand. So uh, if that's a, a question on your mind, like why do people suffer and what's the point of it, this is a good letter uh, to read because St. I mean, Peter's focusing on that. He's reminding Christians about the call to holiness, uh, and he's focusing on the salvation of our souls, that this is really, really critical work and importance uh, for all of us. So I think this letter has a lot to say for 21st century Christians. I think it's going to have even more to say uh, in the years ahead, uh, especially uh, about our identity in Christ in the face of persecution. In the, in the case of a, of a world around us that doesn't <coughs> fully understand us or maybe intentionally wants to misrepresent us, I think it's really, really important, and you'll hear uh, a lot about that in this. I think it has to say about facing tough times and tough circumstances and just when we go through personal challenges in life, what's the point of it? Well, that's always been a, a Christian question to ask, and St. Peter's asking that and reflecting on that in this letter. And then, as I say, it has a lot to do uh, with holiness, uh, the work that each one of us um, uh, has to do with Christ's gift and grace uh, to become more like him. So that's my introduction to this whole thing. Uh, that's why we're doing this. Uh, I think it's going to be a great study. Uh, First Peter has five chapters, and so uh, over the tonight it's just going to be kind of an introductory night. You're going to break to your groups and get to know each other and all that. Uh, but then five chapters, a chapter a week over the next five weeks, and then in the last week before Ash Wednesday, we'll talk about the letter to Jude. Okay. That sound like a good program, good plan? Good. All right, so here's the deal. If you know what group you're in and you know where you're going, I assume all the groups are going to the same spots that they were last time. Am I right about that? Okay, they are. So if you know where you're going and you know what group you're in, <clears throat> Go now, and y'all just dismiss when the group's done. If you don't know where you're going, stay here, and I'll help you.